chapter 5, verse 8. Thank you, Lord. This is where we started all this from. If you're new with us today, I apologize. We are in a series that we've been, I think this is week number 7 or something like that. We're, we're deep in this already. And uh, this, this is based off of, off of my book, The Power of Purity. I believe the Lord gave us a word this year um, that this was the year that we would see God more clearly. This was the year of clarity. And what does that mean? It means seeing God clearly in all aspects of life. It's seeing God clearly when you go to the supermarket. Lord, which bacon should I buy? Which eggs should I get? You know, some people will think that's kind of weird. But I think it's weird if you're not involving God in everything in your life. I mean, if you ask the Lord where to, where to shop, what to buy, I can guarantee you that he will lead you to buy the, the cheapest one or, the, or the, the best deal. Not the cheapest one, but the best deal. And, and it'll save you money. So involve him when you go to the store. Try it out and see what happens. Let us know if something good happens. But when we involve God in all of our life, we're seeing him clearly. I mean, going to the store, we can involve him there. Um, Coming to church. You know, people don't get anything from the Lord when they come to church because they don't expect it. Some people just come to church to come to church. But when you come to church and you have an expectation to receive, you will see God clearly. You will see what he's trying to say to you in that service, right? So come to church expecting to see him. So yeah, this, this whole purpose was to teach us, because this is, this is something that has to be taught, to teach us how to see God more clearly. You know, there's, um, on, on, when you have a radio, there's radio waves that are constantly going throughout the air. You can't see them. There's telev- television signals that are being broadcast all over the world, but we can't see them. But once we tune to a certain frequency, I mean, now it's pretty easy with the click of a button, but back then, even with radios, you had to tune to a specific frequency, and then you would, then you would hear whatever was supposed to be broadcasting clearly, right? But what, what did that take? That took you having to find the right frequency, you can't see the radio, radio waves, but do you believe they exist? Yeah. Absolutely. See, we can't see God. We can't see him physically. We can't see him in, in, this, in, that, in that way, just like how you cannot see radio wa- waves, but you can see the result yeah. of those waves once you find the right station. Yeah. You can hear the proof that those waves exist when you turn tune to the right frequency, Correct? And the same thing with the Lord. You cannot hear God audibly. You cannot see him physically. But when you tune to the right frequency, you'll start to see the evidence of those waves of his work. Amen? So that's what this is all about, is seeing him more clearly, doing certain things in our life to see him more clearly. This is part five of our mind. I told you, I, I asked if you're okay with it. I told you we'd be doing this for for a long time, specifically in the mind, because your mind is is the most vital part of your whole being. You have the Spirit of God living on the inside of you, and you have your physical body that's trying to access the things in the Spirit, and your soul is the key factor. It is the pivotal point that determines whether or not you experience life and godliness. So your, your mind... It is, it is such an important part of your entire being. If, if, I believe it is the most important part of your being, aside from the spirit, because without a proper mind, you will not be able to receive the things of God. Thank you, Lord. Did you find Matthew 5, verse 8 yet? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So Jesus gives us the solution. How do I see God more clearly? Purify your heart. Purify the heart. Now, if you're a born-again believer, you are purified in your spirit. That is, that is the, the first thing that you must purify is the spirit. If you've said yes to Jesus, 
He's taken the old things out and he's putting the new things in. You have a new spirit, a brand new creation. You, your spirit is relating to God perfectly all the time. It, it, it's seeing him clearly every single day. Nothing obstructs the view. God relates to you in your spirit. So it doesn't matter if you just sinned yesterday. It doesn't matter if you just thought a bad thought. The way God sees you is through the spirit part of you. That's the, that's the most uh, true part of your identity. It's who you are, who God sees you as. If you don't have a new spirit, well, then God doesn't see you as a son or a daughter. But just saying yes to him brings you into that adoption, that sonship, that, 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 that state of being in his family. And he can see you that way. He relates to you through your spirit. So that's the first part. And now we're in the soul, purifying the soul. What does that look like? Romans 12 says that we must not be conformed to the world, but transformed by the renewing of our minds. And what's the purpose? So that we may prove the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God, right? That's the purpose. Renewing our mind proves God's will. So in other words, it's like when you have a, a blueprint to build a house. You see, the blueprints, they help you construct the home. But if you have the home already built, you don't have to show someone the blueprints because the home's already there to prove that you followed the blueprints, right? right. So the word of God is our blueprints. You don't have to show someone the word of God to show that you followed the blueprints. Your life, your whole entire conduct is demonstration that you followed the blueprints correctly. You're proving God. You're proving his will every single day through your conduct. So the mind, that's the beginning of all. But before you can start doing anything on the outside, you have to change things on the inside. I talked to you a little bit about our flooding issue that we've had at the church. You see, the issue that we had was... The foundation, there's the steps that come into the church. There's a, there were cracks where the steps touched the building. All of the water goes down into the foundation and it seeps down into the basement. You see, it, it would have been easier just to address the outside of it first, but they had to actually, I, what I heard, I wasn't here, but I heard that the people working on it went underneath the church to fix the issue. They had to go inside the steps to start fixing the issue. See, we could have put duct tape on the outside. We could have called it good. But we would have ran to the same issue a couple years down the road because it wasn't actually fixed. We just took care of the things on the surface. You have to get underneath the surface to start fixing those root issues. Amen. And that's the same thing with this. We don't, I don't preach change your behavior. I don't preach be a good person before you come to church. I don't, I don't care about that. I don't care if you just did something horrible yesterday. Come to church. I don't care. Come to church. And the reason is because if you just fix the outside, eventually you're going to run into the same issues and have to fix them all over again. Why? Because you never dealt with the root. So the Bible says that the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever you put in your heart, the mouth speaks. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So whatever you say is going to produce death or life. But whatever you say stems for what comes in the heart. So you've got to fix this first. You've got to fix everything that comes, uh, that's on the inside of you. In Proverbs chapter 4, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. We talked about this last week. We're going to touch on it again today. It says, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. You know what inclining your ear uh, is relating to? Anyone have any, any animals, any cats? Anyone have cats? So we have, we have cats in our house. And uh, whenever they're, they're sitting in our living room, they'll be looking at us and their ears will be straight forward. But the moment they hear something like maybe the, the refrigerator makes a noise or something happens outside, I'll notice their ears will go 180 backwards, right? You ever noticed that before? If you have horses, horses do the same exact thing. If they'll be looking straight, their ears will be, ears will be forward, and then they'll, they'll hear something behind them, and their ear will completely just turn around and listen to that thing behind. That's an example of inclining your ear. 
to, to pay attention. Where, where is that sound coming from? It says, incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Why? Because I said so? For they are life. They're life. They are life to those who find them, and they are health to all their flesh. Amen. It goes on to say, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Again, if you just change the outside of you, if you just stop cussing and you stop drinking and you stop smoking and you stop watching this and saying that and doing this, if you stop doing all those things but you never address the heart, you're going to find your way back into those things eventually. I'm just telling you that. You're, you're going to become what you tried to not become because you didn't change the inside. I'm not against these programs and, and these, these self-help things like AA and all those. Like they have good intentions. But did you know that in, in, in when you're going to AA, you're told once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. So no matter what you do, if you ever go back to the drink, you're going to be an alcoholic again. Why? Because they're just dealing on the surface. They're just touching the surface. They don't address the inside. Mm. See, that, that's not the issue. The issue is not drinking. The issue isn't, isn't cussing. The issue isn't those, those natural things, your behavior. The issue is what's on the inside. What do you, who do you believe you are? Do you believe you're an alcoholic, always an alcoholic? Do you believe that you're a sinner saved by grace? Once a sinner, always a sinner. No, you got to change your mindset. You got to change the way you think. The, per the person who thinks I'm a sinner saved by grace is the person who thinks it doesn't matter what I do, I'll always, I'll always go back to that temptation. Mm -mm. You are a new creation in Christ. Brand new creation. I don't care what you do on the outside. You're a brand new creation. See, Alcohol Anonymous will never say, they'll, they'll, they'll always say, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Why? Because the things of the word are foolishness to them. They don't understand it with their foolish minds. They, don't, they can't get it with their natural minds. It's the natural that doesn't receive things from the spiritual. They are spiritually discerned. So they'll never get it. So I don't blame them. I don't judge them. I don't talk down on them. That's just what they do. That's just what they believe. And but when we know what the Bible says, all those things can be different. Amen? All of them. Out of it springs the issues of life. Guard your heart. Verse 24. Put away a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder. Think about. Meditate. Make a wise decision about the path of your feet and let all your uh, ways be established, be founded. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. The sad thing is, people will look at these scriptures and say, this is legalism. This is religion. I'm not religious. I have a relationship with God. Absolutely, sure, whatever. But there's things you got to do. See, these aren't a list of, of things to do for God to love you. What did we just read? We read, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Don't let them depart from your heart. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Why? For their life. Their life. It does, if, if it said, right now church, if it said, do all these things for God won't love you if you don't, then we got a whole different issue here. It just says for their life, their health. Do you want to experience health in life? Do these things. You see, we don't have a problem going to the doctor's office and having a prescription given to us and having the doctor say, stop doing this, take these three times a day and see if results come. We don't have a problem with that. We're eager to have those prescriptions. But the moment the, the word of God says, stop doing this, do this, and you'll see life and health, we get all offended. Oh, I can't believe it says this. I don't want to do that. What happened? 
We trust more in in natural things than we do in spiritual things. Look, and this is what I love about this message and this whole entire series is that this has nothing to do with how God loves you. This has everything to do with how you see God. That's it. This is to benefit you. This is to benefit your relationship with God. Mm. Thank you, Lord. See, when, when people go to marriage counseling or then they're having issues in their marriage and they, they see a counselor and they want to talk about these issues. The issue isn't stop doing this and start doing this. That's not the issue. You can, you can go to a marriage counselor and if you're, if you're dealing with a, a naggy wife or you're dealing with a lazy husband, the issue isn't, well, husband, start doing more work. Or wife, stop nagging your husband. That's not, that's not going to fix anything. The thing that will fix the marriage is love each other. Do things to that, that show you love each other. Husband, if you love your wife, go do something for her. Go, go, go change the diaper. Go, go clean the, the living room. Go do something to show you, not so that you can get her to stop nagging, just so you can show her you love her. Wife, if you want your husband to get off his butt and to start doing something around the house, well, then maybe... Be presentable. Be nice because you love him. Not because you're trying to get something from him, but because you love him. If you got ready when you were dating, you can get ready when you're married. What what changed? You were trying to impress him. You were trying to love on him. But now you got comfortable, and so now both of you guys have let yourself go, and now you have these issues. Love each other. Love each other. That's the simplest thing. I don't care if if you do all the works, whatever, sure, acts of love, physical touch, I don't care. Love each other, and all the issues are going to go away. You see, the Bible is so simple, you need help to misunderstand it. Thank you, Lord. But there's there's something about these scriptures. I want to read them again. It says, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for their life for those who find them and health to their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Put away a deceitful mouth. Put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight and your eyelids right before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Let your ways be established. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. Now, let me ask you this, church. Did Jesus or did God through his word in any of this, of, of, of this part of this scripture say, God will keep your eyes straight ahead. God will keep your eyelids looking right before you. God will ponder the path of your feet. God will establish your path. God won't wait, go left or right. No. no. What does it say? You, you do it. This is the point I'm trying to make. Jesus is not going to take the wheel. He's not going to take the wheel. Jesus, take the wheel. Remember that song from Carrie Underwood or whoever? Jesus, take the wheel. You see, it's so fun to say that because it's easy. It's a cop-out. It's a Christian cop-out. God, life is hard. Take the wheel. I can't do it no more. Look. You'll still be just as depressed and just as tired and just as worried by praying that prayer than by doing all the work yourself. Why? Jesus isn't going to take the will because he's the one who bought the car and told you to drive it. You know, the car is a metaphor for life. He purchased your life and said, here, here's the keys. Have fun. See, Jesus is in the passenger seat telling you where to go, but you're driving the car. Do you have to listen to him? Should you? See, people were thinking that Jesus bought us a Tesla for life, and now it's just auto driving. <laughs> it's not how it works. It's our responsibility. See, God, God we, we can't pray to, for God to just give us life and health. Lord, please give me life and health. Are you doing things to produce life and health? Simple as that. Are you doing things that, that, what we read last week, 
that those who the, uh, minding the flesh equals death, and those who mind the spirit produce life and peace. Are you minding the flesh or minding the spirit? What are you doing? See, God has given you. The Bible says, I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Therefore, choose life. He's not choosing it for you. He's not making the, the choice for you. It's a simple, multiple choice answer, and you just choose the right one. And he gives you the answer. Choose life. He's not going to take your will. If you want to drive off a cliff at 100 miles an hour, he will let you. You see, this is, this is the fun part. I love, I love talking about God. Because then we get into the debate of does God allow things in our life? And this is what, this is what the Lord helped me kind of see. There's two ways to look at God allowing things in your life, meaning God God's letting the devil just afflict you. And that's not in the Bible. But there's another way to look at it, and is it's God allows what you allow. God's given you all power and authority, all dominion. And he can't take it back because he'd go against his word. And the Bible says that if he goes against his word, I mean, it's just, the whole world will explode. Because the foundations of the world are held together by his words. So if he said, here, here's all power, here's, here's all authority. Here you go, Esther, I'm giving you all power, all authority. Have dominion on this earth. Rule it. And then later on he goes, hey, I, actually, I foresaw something in the future. Let me have that power back, and I'll reprogram your life. He'd go against his word. He'd go back on his word, and, and everything would fall apart. So by giving you power and authority... You have the responsibility. There's the R word, the one that every Christian hates. Responsibility. You mean it's your fault that your life sucks? Yes. Responsibility. And he says, here, you take control of your life. Listen to me. I'll guide you. But you take control. This is your life to live. I have the plans I have for you, says the Lord. But the scripture goes on and says, he will seek him. See, that's, we missed that part in Jeremiah 29, 11. I'm going to pull that up really quick because that's what the Lord put it in my head. Oh, I went too far. Stop going too far. My fingers are too fat. There we go. Jeremiah 29, 11. Everyone loves this one. For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Oh, yes, Lord, I received that. You have the plan set before me. You have my life already established. It's whatever your will will happen. Verse 12. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me. When you search for me with all of your hearts, I will be found by you, says the Lord. God has the plan set before us, but it takes us to seek him. So if we want to, we can drive our, our car right off of a cliff. And he says, dang, I wish I did not give him authority. But he can't do nothing about it. He tied his hands behind his back by his own words. Was it a mistake? Nope. It's free will. So he won't take the wheel like most people think. He will let you drive to your destruction if you want to but he's screaming at you. The Bible says in, in Proverbs, just one scripture, one, a uh, couple chapters over, in Proverbs verse one, it says, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the streets. Verse 21, she cries out in the chief concourse at the opening of the city gates. She speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity or open-mindedness? How long will you be open-minded? For scorners delight in their scorning and the fools hate knowledge. Turn at my rebuke. You know what a rebuke is? A rebuke isn't, hey, you're going to want to turn in in a thousand feet. No. When you're driving down the road and you're about to drive off the cliff, wisdom saying, turn. 
and we're not listening. And we drive off the cliff and we go, God, why didn't you save me? And we make God out to be the bad guy. Thank you, Lord. Let's read this again. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. I want to put it in a different light. It says this, My son, give attention to my words. When you read this, I want you to, to underline or emphasize the word my. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Don't let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. If, if, see, if we have to, if we have to, if, he, if the word had to focus on those words, my son, my words, it's because the Lord's trying to tell us there's other voices speaking. If you're mine, listen to me only. See, my, I love my son so much. And when he grows and he's, he's able to start understanding things and comprehending things, I'm teaching him, you listen to me. I don't care what other people might have to say. You listen to my words, son. Don't listen to what, what your uncle has to say. Don't listen to what your, your this has to say. You listen to me. If anything sounds different than what I say, don't trust it. And that's what I'm going to tell my son. By the grace, by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, I will be speaking what the Lord wants to speak through me. And I'll tell him, be careful, son. There's a lot of voices, a lot of people that are going to try to convince you to listen to something that's wrong. There's a lot of doctrines, a lot of studies, a lot of worldly things that are out there in the world that are trying to get you to listen to something other than God. Don't. Listen to me. And if we paint a picture, this is the Lord speaking to us as children. Listen to my words. Mm. But it takes us to attend to God's word. It's our responsibility to, to put God's word at the forefront of our mind. It says, keep them in the midst of your heart. Don't let them depart from your eyes. It's really hard to do that when you're working eight hours a day, isn't it? It's really hard to, to show up at work at 8 a.m. Hey, boss, how's it going? 